All four were available and somewhat vulnerable. Three of these victims were hitchhiking, and one was on a public telephone at 2 o'clock in the morning. My sister, you know, she was hitching, which she's just such a trusting soul, I think. Once the body was found, it was pretty horrible. All four of these victims were also found uh, in a wooded area in a remote section off of a dirt road. My sister was supposedly wrapped in 10 foot by 12 foot black plastic tarp. And not that far off the dirt road. The bodies were not separated by a great distance. All of this was, was too much to just dismiss as, as coincidence. Coming up, a survivor. All I can remember is trying to protect my baby, trying to get him so the knife would not hit my belly. And he stabbed me about 27 times. And later. Here was a guy who had the background that fit the combination of methodical mind uh, and savage mind. By the spring of 1987, a suspected serial killer stabbed five women to death in the Connecticut River Valley. There was a pretty general theme that ran through the killings. The women were cut in their neck, which is the way that uh, soldiers are taught to uh, disable their victim. The use of the knife, first of all, there was a connecting piece of information. Second, and even more uh, uh, critical, a knife kill is a fairly intimate kill. You don't get knife killers mm -hmm. commonly. And to have more than one knife killer in the valley is just very unlikely. Three of the victims worked in hospitals or nursing homes. So that again was a common denominator in, in, in my mind. You always wonder, is there a patent here we're looking at? I think by that time, probably the majority of people uh, expected another attack. On January 10th, 1987, another nurse, Barbara Agnew, vanished on the way home from a ski trip. Barbara allegedly had left the mountain at 10 o'clock at night in order to arrive back home. It was a, a terrible snowstorm, fairly late at night, and she pulled into the rest area in White River on 91. By Sunday, she hadn't returned back, and the police were contacted. And she was uh, classified as a missing person for some time after that. But in, again, in your heart, as an investigator, you, you, you know this is a homicide. Days later, when they found her car, there was significant blood splatter in the car. And that was the first clue that we were talking grave concerns. Nearly three months later, Barbara's corpse was discovered. There were signature wounds that were very distinctive. There was one wound to the neck that is a disabling wound because you bleed freely and you lose strength. And then multiple stab wounds, self-defense wounds, knife wounds. Barbara Agnew was almost a, a carbon copy of Linda Moore and was too much to just overlook at the time. From my point of view, there wasn't any question that he was going to strike again. The next victim, a young woman driving home late at night on New Hampshire's old Homestead Highway. On August 6th of 1988, Jane Borowski had pulled into Garmello's Marketplace in the town of Swansea. She was coming back from a fair at about 12.30 in the morning. She was seven months pregnant at the time. It was just real, real muggy and hot. They had a couple of vending machines, so I got a soda. And I got in my car, and that's when I noticed a vehicle had pulled up beside me. And um, it was a Jeep Wagoneer. But I didn't think too much about it. And the next thing I know, I saw him walking around the back side of my car. And I was scared. He opened the door of her car, tried to grab her by the wrist. She pushed and kicked at him. I started screaming, and matter of fact, I screamed so loud that I broke the blood, blood vessels in my eyes. Next thing I knew, he took a knife out 
and he put the knife up against my neck. Eventually, he overcame her. He dragged her out in the parking lot, and he started stabbing her. He had cut my neck, and I ran. He had, like, tackled me down like a football player, got me on the ground, and just proceeded to stab me. And all I can remember is trying to protect my baby, trying to get him so the knife would not hit my belly. At that point in time, Jane basically plays dead. The suspect gets into his vehicle, and he departs the area. He got up and walked away so cool and calm and collected and just like he was going on with his business. And I had been on my back, so I rolled over to my hands and knees. And as I was getting up on my hands and knees, I could see him drive by me. And I, I, I think that's a vision I'll never forget. Extraordinarily, he didn't stab her anywhere around her belly. Jane was able to get herself up, get back into her car, and drive out uh, looking for help. I can remember waking up in intensive care, and they were describing all my injuries, which were um, cut my jugular vein, I had two collapsed lungs, he had a tendon in my knee, he had a tendon in my thumb, and they predicted uh, between 23 and 27 stab wounds. She's extremely fortunate that nothing hit vital organs that, that would have caused her death. My baby. He ended up having problems. I ended up having her about two weeks early. She was born a blue baby with no blood pressure. So now she has mild cerebral palsy. For Borowski, the memories cut deeper than her wounds. I've been in the hospital twice for mental breakdowns. I've suffered depression. I've been suicidal. I have compulsive disorders. I have trust issues. I'm not the person I was before I was attacked. Jane will never understand why she was the one who survived, especially when her savage assault seemed eerily similar to the murders of the six other women who were methodically slain in the Connecticut River Valley. It started coming out in the paper that my attack may have been stemmed from a serial killer. So I was very scared because I'm thinking, he's killed before, he tried to kill me, is he gonna come back and kill me? Coming up. I saw his picture and I was like, yeah, there's similarities. And it was pretty overwhelming. Everything fit with him. In the mid-1980s, six women were brutally murdered within a 100-mile radius centered on an area along the Vermont-New Hampshire border known as the Connecticut River Valley. The killer remained on the loose. This guy had places that he wanted to go by to see who was available, who was in his trap line. He was willing to stab immediately if he had to. He wanted to control, to transport, uh, to torture, humiliate, and, and ultimately destroy. In December 1988, 22-year-old Michelle Ashley disappeared from Holyoke, Massachusetts. When the police arrived in her apartment, they found the Christmas presents were all wrapped in, underneath the tree. Nothing was open. Uh, there were spoiled food in the refrigerator. Before she vanished, Michelle allegedly told her mother, if I'm ever missing, he killed me, referring to her husband, Vietnam veteran Michael Nicolau. But for 13 years, the missing persons case stayed off the radar. But when police finally interviewed Michael Nicolau about this. His first response was that he didn't know who, who they were talking about. And, and that, that was a red flag to me. Nicolau's spotty past also roused the interest of private investigator Lynn Marie Cardi. In 2001, she was convinced the ex-soldier played a role in the disappearance. I called up Michael Nicolau and I said, I was asked by your wife's mother to find her daughter, Michelle. And 
the two grandkids, where are they? And he said, the grandkids are great. He said, but Michelle was a slut, and she ran off with a drug dealer. And he said, how did you find me?